Bucks, as a, as a player, I mean, you were at, uh, you'd been at the top of your game at, at that time when he arrived. So did you sense then, did you have any idea that this, this, this kid was going to be anywhere near as good as he's turned out to be? Not really. Um, <laughs> no, there was raw talent, clearly, um, but it was, um, it, well, there was a particular off-season when he started training with Jono um, and it was nearly, it was going to go one way or the other and uh, he, he just decided he had a, had, and Mick was just talking about mates, we had a couple of really close mates that were prepared to push each other along and, and it really was the impetus that started, you know, the success of the of those the late 2000s and ultimately the flag and that was, you know, Swanee just deciding that I wanted to make the most of this along with, with John O and a couple of others and and they trained on the off season. I know that much. Um, he came back in a real good, in in real good, really good shape, and and his game just started building from there. Uh, one thing that Swanee does do, and, and really took from that, was you know, you, you'd never really he wouldn't want to tell anyone that he that he's prepared to empty himself out or that he works as hard as he actually did throughout his career. He wouldn't want to give the impression that he actually cared or tried, but that's in, that's in fact what we saw internally. And um, if he wasn't doing it out in the track, he'd be belting himself and on the treadmill and, and you know, doing his six 500s, I think. It was your, it was your staple, mate. And, um, and doing it at a pace that no one else would be able to keep up with and, and just putting 20 minutes of solid work in that would just keep his fitness base up in order to do what he needed to do on the weekend. When we travelled across to Arizona and, and hit the altitude um, training over there, I s said to the boys this morning, when we do the out and backs on the indoor gridiron fields, and um, Butters used to work us over that way, and Swanee would empty himself out more than any other bloke. Um, absolutely exhausted, just give, give uh, everything that he possibly could. So there was that capacity to really push himself into zones that other blokes couldn't go to. Um, and then the way he was utilised by Mick and, and Butters with the rotations really fell into, into his um, sweet spot and he was able to hit the game hard for five or six minutes, have a couple off and then, and then go again. And it just, we really saw the evolution of the, the type of midfielder that we're probably seeing a little bit more now, but he was the prototype and no one's really done it better since. Swanee, why did you, so, why did you suddenly get that work ethic? And was it was it Jono? Is that what Bucks was alluding to? And did something click for you? Was it a bit of maturity, or or did you feel like you're on your on your last chance? Well, yeah, I um I thought I was going to be sacked, and after that blow I got into, and obviously got to the meeting, and Mick just sort of said, "This is your last chance," which um since I've proven him wrong, so I've had more than one since, but <laughs> um <laughs> so lied to me back then but um but yeah I you know I was a kid who got drafted you know dad said I got drafted too early and didn't really care about footy and just thought I was doing what all my 18 year old mates were doing um and trying to fit in an AFL career which was going nowhere and then um thought I was going to be sacked and you know then I realized that you know playing for all the the whinging and moaning that that I do about AFL I'm under no illusion that it's I'll never have I'll never have a better job in my life um you know Playing AFL is an unbelievable thing to do and it's an amazing lifestyle. So I thought I'm going to give it a go. And, you know, without obviously Mick saving my career and, you know, Ben Johnson and Chris Tarrant, um, they sort of made me work with them um, as much as I didn't want to. And, you know, Taz got me in the weight room and John got me sort of running around and they just forced me to run with them. And because I respected those two guys and and I'm really close with them, I... I worked for them. I was like, I'm going to give it a go. I want to, I'll give it 12 months and just see where it ends up. And, and thankfully, somehow, I held on. When you look back now on that, I mean, what do you think about how, how big a decision that was for you to come to and the support you got? Oh, well, I certainly wouldn't be here. There's no doubt. I would probably just play it another year or two and been given the arse. Um, so I, I certainly didn't know the work ethic or the work rate that was needed to, to play at the top level. So, um, oh, there's no doubt without that... I was gone, so um, and I had no idea of how hard it was to be an AFL player. So, um, I, you know, I can't think, thank them enough. So, um, I probably owe them a beer now, but um, now that I'm tired, but uh, yeah, like that's that's pretty much it. They they showed me and they they forced me to work, as obviously they cared about me too as a, as a person and thought I could play. You know, they clearly seen something in me. I don't know how they did, because I was no good, um, but. Um, they must have seen the little bit of ability that I had and, 
and wanted me to make the most of it. And you know, thankfully, I, I probably got you know the best out of myself. You know, I did I look after myself as well as some of the others? Probably not. But you know, I think I got I got the best out of my career and the best you know out of my life in these last 15 years. So I'm, I've probably been lucky. I've had the best of both worlds. I've been able to sort of do as, do what I want, sort of off the field and. You know, play some decent footy on it as well. So, Ed and, and Mick, could could you take us back to what that after that time or at that time from a club point of view, Ed and Mick from a coach point of view, as to what you saw in him to to make sure that he did get that second chance. Well, life's about second chances. I mean, how many people do you see just go through life and have one single go at it and succeed? Because life's about. Um, you know, having a name for a start off, and, and I, I know that regardless of what Dane says, I, I could see that he had a name in life. He had, he had certain ambitions. And, and because you just don't automatically just grow with pride. Pride's part of your DNA. The second phase is, and I said before, that he has got great mates. You know, I know that you don't have a lot of real strong... You have a lot of acquaintances. In football clubs, you, you come in, you wear the same colours, and that's what binds you together. But strong mateship is rare that you have any, any big number. Swanee was able to get those big numbers, and that says something about him for a start off. So the scare tactics of saying to him, we need to, have a, we need to address a couple of issues here. We, need, we needed to, to address those so that it, so the ambition met with the abilities. And, and the second effort and the third effort, and the th it doesn't matter. Life, life will present a number of opportunities for people. And if it meant Dane having his second chance or third chance, and I don't really think it was a second and third chance, it was just simply straightening up. And when you straighten someone up and give them direction, and his teammates, as he's already said, with, with Taz, you know, Taz was no angel when I first arrived at the football club, and, yeah. and, 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 and not, because of, not, because of his, not because of him himself, he just didn't think the football was going to be what he wanted to be. Ben Johnson was different. Benny automatically he grew, grew up barring for Collingwood. His best uh, the player he admired most was Brownie. Brownie was here at the football club. So it was easy. And when they got together, true mateship stood out. So it's, you know, the credit doesn't lie with necessarily the people who instruct. It lies with the, peop the person who's taken on the ability, taken on the, on, the, on the resources that are available to him, friendship, mateship, the football club, and do something about it. Second chance and third chance, life's about that. So that's not the issue. It was more to say, don't waste, don't waste the talent you've got. And I always think that when you've got that talent and you know that you've got love from home, don't waste what your parents have given you. And we can see the, the great admiration that the parents have got. And some people don't have that, so you've got to find something else. It might be just a mateship, it might be a distant relative. But here, strong family background, strong football club, strong mateship, all you needed is just to break down a few barriers and, and send him in that right direction. So when he looked after himself, he had the ability, had great pride. The, the pride factor was the greatest because he was not going to see someone beat him. And that's, that's easy then to direct, so easy to direct. Ed, how did you see it at the time? It was funny because uh, the chief executive at the time was Greg Swan, who played uh, in a premiership uh, period with Billy at Williamstown. I grew up in Broadie with uh, the family and, in fact, uh, my father and uh, uh, Swanee's uh, grandfather were, were great mates uh, and uh, the Ramsey's uh, grandfather. And uh, so we all sort of knew each other. Everyone was barracking for him. So he had a guy from Brody whose father played footy with the CEO and Mick was there who uh, wanted to give him a chance. So it was, it was a lot of good cop, bad cop going on because we we're probably trying to scare him straight, to be perfectly honest, because we knew all about him. But I remember Noel Judkins coming to me and saying, we might go with our late pick with uh, Billy Swan's boy. And I was wrapped because uh, as a kid growing up, Billy Swan and Roy Ramsey were the two heroes in, in Broadmeadows. Uh, these you know, migrant boys coming to uh, Australia, growing up in the housing commissions and really teaching the kids around there. So when Swanee came through, to see what he's been able to do with himself and to walk in as a guy who, I laughed when I saw him walk in the first day, he just looked like somebody out of the streets of Glasgow, had that, that Scottish walk about him, um, in, in case somebody was going to come around the, the corner with a knife, in case he was ready to go. And uh, he just had this walk and a, and a purpose about him. But to be sitting up here today, next to a premiership that he played a massive part in bringing to our club, to name him now amongst the greatest players in the history of the club, and I was thinking before, 
In 124 years of the Collingwood Football Club, Dick Lee was the first superstar. Jock McHale was the biggest name. Collier, Coventry, Regan, Rose, Richards, Fonce Kine, Murray Wiedemann, Peter Moore, Tony Shaw, and to the modern day heroes like Peter Dacos, Mick McGuan, and now Dane Swan. He's one of the greatest players in the history of this club. He's the player of his generation. All the ornaments he brought to the game, including a beloved Collingwood Premiership. But to walk out of here as a bloke who did it his way and who brought his club along with him, who was loved from the president to the cheer squad, to the boot stutter, to his teammates, to his captains, to his coach, is something that's quite spectacular. Very few people walk out of any institution after such a long time with the love and admiration. And when you look at his family, his mum Dee, who was the executive assistant of the year last year in the CEO magazine. Billy, of course, the superstar in the VFA. His grandfather, Billy, over here, played for Victorian soccer out in the ground behind us at the old Olympic Park. It's been an amazing migrant story. And to see this bloke, the quintessential Aussie, and the star of Aussie Rules become one of the biggest names in the history of the Collingwood Football Club is one of the great stories of our time. And it's been a pleasure to have you on board. Swanee, you're a star, mate. Just to change pace for, for a minute, Swanee, uh, what about your relationship with the media? You've gone on to be a star on the footy show and you didn't really... I mean, you, obviously, you, there's some headlines and all that along the way, but uh, how have you, how's your relationship been with the media? Um, Oh, I've been frosty at times, but um, listen, in the end, I've never really had a problem with with the footy journos and stuff like that. If they, um, I understand they've got a job to do, so I have absolutely no problem with them commenting on games and if, if, I'm not, if I can't play or I can't kick or we went no good, they're not the ones that have the problem with. It's, it's obviously the gossip ones, which, which I have a fair problem with. Um, so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like them very much. But um, the, the sports journos and that who are fully on footy, I don't have a problem with that. Um, that's their job. We all have a job. And I guess probably I'm kind of still contracted to nine the footy show. I'm, I'm, so I'm a media personality now than of an AFL footballer. So that's my <laughs> job, I guess. But um, listen, I, I, yeah, I try to avoid them every now and then. I'd much prefer to be on the back of the paper than the front of the paper. But um, yeah, it is what it is. I like to think that when I was interviewed, I sort of gave what I had to and, and did my thing. I didn't really knock back much stuff. Um, obviously, I'm on the free show now and enjoy that. So on Thursday night, so I'll do that. But um, That's a good plug. Yeah. At 8.30. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, I'm not sure what the future holds for me, but you know, that might be a path that I go down. But, but in the end, it's my career's over now, so if all the people at the front of the papers, can you please leave me alone and just <laughs> let me do my thing? But... Um, yeah, but apart from that, just write how good I was tomorrow and then leave me alone, yeah. <laughs> good luck with... Hey, Hado, we will miss those three o'clock phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> Monday morning's going to be a different year. Half the phone calls are probably about me, so... A bit quieter now, you reckon?